Welcome to Foreign Countries, Conversations in Archaeology with me, Ash Lenton. If you're enjoying Foreign Countries and you want to hear more episodes, please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button, foreigncountries.podbean.com. In this episode, we'll be talking about human remains, grave goods and personal identity. When I was an undergrad, it was drummed into me that the dead don't bury themselves, but two new papers have suggested that a little more nuance is necessary. Perhaps the agency and the personhood of the dead is being overlooked in this. Shortly, I'll be talking to Kevin P. Smith and Dr. Michelle Hayer smith about their paper in medieval archaeology, but I'm joined now by Dr. Emma Brownlee of Girton College, Cambridge, to talk about her paper on the dead and their possessions in the European Journal of Archaeology around 6th and 7th century graves and some of those more nuanced approaches. So welcome, Emma. In terms of a starting point, what do we know about furnishing graves in 6th and 7th century Europe and what were you aiming for in this paper? So this started from my PhD research, actually. Um, And my PhD research looked at the the transition from furnished to unfurnished burial and how that occurred looking right across Western Europe. So we know that in lots of different areas that there was this big change in funerary practices, that people go from burying their dead with loads and loads of stuff in the graves, loads of grave goods, but that changes very quickly. So by the end of the seventh century, almost everybody is being buried in a very simple, plain, unfurnished manner with no grave goods in the graves. And I was interested in why that transition occurred over such a broad area in so many different parts of Europe, because a lot of the explanations that have been put forward for that are very, very regionally based. In England, you get a lot of people talking about the conversion to Christianity, but that just doesn't apply in other areas of Europe where you see the same change. And another one of the things that I didn't particularly like about a lot of the current interpretations of that change, I found a lot of the current interpretations of that change to be very focused on the mourners themselves, but to approach it in a quite emotionless way. You get theories of status. There are a lot of theories of an increase in social hierarchies. So towards the end of the period of furnished burial, you get a lot of big, rich, monumental graves, things like Sutton Hoo. And this is because social hierarchies are becoming more and more entrenched. But then at the end of the period of furnished burial, it's almost like they're so entrenched that you don't need to display your status through grave goods anymore. And I always found that theory a bit dissatisfying because when you have a community who's burying an important member, a member of a family, a loved one, the first thing in your mind isn't usually going to be status display. It might be a part of the funerary ritual, but if you just look at these funerary rituals through status display, you lose some of the emotion that goes alongside it that was for me a starting point I was trying to find a way of putting some of the emotion back into the funeral and thinking about ways in which people actually interact with the dead and then something else I wanted to do was to think not so much about these very modern western ways of interacting with the dead because in our world you know I think we're quite insulated from death and the processes around it and how dead bodies are prepared for funerals. In Britain today, I think very few people will have actually seen a dead body, and the families have very little input in the practicalities of preparing for funerals. And that's completely different to how people would have interacted with dead bodies in the past. So something else I wanted to do was to try and move away from those Western approaches and explore some you know, slightly more innovative ideas about how people relate to the dead, And then thinking, if I do that, how does this change some of those big interpretations of grave good change that we see in the early medieval period? And what methods did you apply in developing some of these new strands of interpretation? So I think I take three different strands of three different ways of approaching this topic. So the first is the data collection. So I went through an awful lot of cemetery excavation reports everything that I could find from across Western Europe that had a good grave catalogue and that had good chronological evidence. 
And the chronological evidence was really important because you know, obviously when you're trying to look at change over time, you, know, you need to have a solid foundation of when that change might be occurring. And I compiled a, a large database. So I ended up with 246 cemeteries overall, and that had just over 33,000 graves in it. And then I looked at that through a couple of different statistical methods, and then also analysed it through some more anthropological and historical methods as well. So for the statistical methods, I looked at heat maps in GIS software. You can take a load of points on a map, and it shows you what the areas of density are. And so I created a series of relative kernel density heat maps. That's a tool where you measure the the density, say, of grave wood use in this instance against another proxy. So against the density of cemetery use. And that was important because otherwise you just get areas where there have been an awful lot of excavations showing up as being the very dense areas. And it's hard to tell if that's actual high grave wood use that you're seeing or whether it's just excavation biases. And I made those maps, not just for numbers of grave goods, but also for all the different types of objects that you might find. You can see where the different types of grave goods, where some of them are most common and where they're less common. And then I made a series of those maps looking over time so I could see how that density changed. But that's a very broad overview. It can be quite generalizing at times and you can lose some of the the nuance. So I also looked at some individual cemeteries to look in a bit more detail about what's going on with the grave good use there. The case study I use in this instance is the site of Pleidelsheim, which is in southwestern Germany in the modern day province of Baden-Württemberg. And that's a nice site because it had an awful lot of chronological study done on it. So it means that I can be very confident of the phases that the graves are assigned to. And that makes looking at the change over time really easy. And I I looked at the same sorts of things that I'd done at that broader scale within that cemetery, at the numbers of grave goods and at the different types of grave goods. But I also looked at the locations that objects were being placed in the grave. So how the objects were being related to the body. To try and get into some of those individual decisions that are being made at the graveside about what's important. I also looked at a lot of the anthropological literature around how people relate to dead bodies and how people relate to death. I looked at a particular Indonesian society which I find really interesting because there the moment of death does not happen for them at biological death. Uh, So they keep the dead bodies of their relatives in their houses for quite a few months after the biological death has occurred. And they're treated as though they're living people still. So they're still fed, they're still clothed, they're they're referred to as being sick. And it's only once the funeral occurs that they actually become dead. That gave me some ideas I could work with for different ways people may have interpreted death and dead bodies in the past. And I also looked at the historical literature. So I wanted to see what written evidence do we have for what people are thinking about death and thinking about dead bodies in the past. So are we talking about grave goods in the sense of personal possessions, not necessarily items placed by the mourners at the funeral? One of the things that really struck me when I looked both at the heat maps and at Pleidelsheim is that even though you get this wholesale decline in grave good use, personal accessories are something that really, really stands out as a grave good type that continues to be used right up until that final abandonment. When all other grave goods are declining, people are still putting personal accessories in the grave. And I mean, I'm counting personal accessories as being things like knives, keys, girdle hangers, the types of things that you carry with you and use every day. Yeah, they continue to be put in graves. And then this got me thinking a bit about different types of possession and different ways in which objects will relate to the body and how that might change on death. So one of the things we could be looking at here is the way in which different types of possessions work on death. So we can talk about alienable possessions, which are things that don't have an awful lot of value to a person. You know, they're an object that you own, but it might be quite a utility, not something that has a great deal of attachment for you. And then you have inalienable possessions. And inalienable possessions are things that have much more of a personal attachment. So something that might have a bit more sentimental value, 
that is a really important object to you and you wouldn't just give it away casually. But then you also have another step beyond that and you have something called inseparable possessions. And those are, are things which are so tightly entwined with your person that it's almost impossible to give them away. And as an example of that, I like to talk about my glasses. You know, I can't give these away to someone else. I use them every day. They're basically a part of me. So these different types of possessions, we have some evidence for the existence of those possessions and what they might have been in the early medieval period. Uh, and for this, I drew quite heavily on the work of Alison Clevness, looking at grave reopening. And she's done this wonderful study looking at grave reopening in Kent in particular, where she looks at the types of objects which are being removed from reopened graves, but the types of objects which are being left in them as well. And a lot of what I have classed as personal accessories are the types of objects which are being left in graves. So they might be reopened, things like the sword might be taken out, the jewellery might be taken out, but the knife is left behind. And one interpretation of that is that knives fall into this category of inseparable possessions. So they're a very personal object that you carry with you all the time. When you're using it for everyday tasks, it can become worn in a way that no one else can use it, the way the handle wears, the way the blade wears. So these can be considered inseparable possessions in an early medieval context. And it's those inseparable possessions that you're seeing being continually deposited in graves right up until that point of, of final abandonment of grave good use. So bringing that evidence together with some of the anthropological theories about death and dying, I wonder if what we're seeing here is actually a change in the way the corpse is being perceived. So early in the sixth century, when grave good use is common, we're seeing almost a continuation of the personhood of the body after death. And it's that continuation of personhood, which is letting the grave goods be placed in the graves in such large numbers. But as the sixth and seventh century goes on, we could be starting to see this decline in the personhood of the corpse, as well as a decline in grave good use. And so by the end of the seventh century, you know, that corpse is not being seen so much as a person anymore. The point at which death occurs has shifted slightly earlier in the funeral cycle. The body that's being put in the ground can't maintain those possessive links with the objects in the same way it could earlier, apart from the inseparable possessions, because they're not a part of the person so much, they're a part of the body itself. So they have to remain with the body regardless of how it's being perceived. We also see the evidence for this in the way in which the locations of the grave goods change at Plydell time. So early in the sixth century, the grave goods are being placed very much in association with the body. So where you'd expect to find them during life, almost as if the corpse still needed to use the objects in some way. Whereas as you get later and later in time, even those inseparable possessions start being placed a little bit further away from the body. So it's almost as if they're being put in the grave because they kind of have to be kept with the body, but they don't need to be laid out in the semblance of life in quite the same way because it's not a living person that you still have. We also see some support for this in the historical literature as well. Yeah, this was the time of Christian conversions around Europe. Was that a driving factor? So one of the things you get in some of the Christian writings in this period is this shift in emphasis from bodily resurrection to more of an emphasis on purgatory and heaven and hell and that becomes more of the end goal rather than resurrection. Resurrection is still important, it's still an aspect of Christian theology but it's being downplayed a lot in the sources. You see this downplaying taking place at pretty much the same time you start seeing the change in funerary rites. So obviously these historical sources are being written at a more elite level than most of the funerals that are taking place. So I don't think we're seeing a direct link there, but it's important to think of these ideas as circulating at the same time. And how do you see research around this developing? If we're going to be more nuanced, what do we need to do now? So one of the things I really want people to take away from this paper, and this applies not just to medievalists, but I think to all archaeologists who are working with funerary remains, is to think a little bit more about what the mourners themselves thought of the burial and how they related to the dead body. I don't want people to just think of graves as being these 
static remains where there's a dead body in there and then there's some objects in there and then what does that tell us about society i want people to think more closely through the emotional decisions that are being made in a funeral because they're very emotional times i don't think anyone would deny that for any society that a funeral is an emotional event and how those emotions might affect what we're seeing and let's move away from looking at skeletons as just these sources of information but as potential people and getting some some new ideas into archaeology about the way in which people related to dead bodies and how they thought of them can vastly change the way we interpret funerary remains and in terms of where I'm going next with this so I'm saying very much within the early medieval funerary realm and I'm working on bringing a little bit more nuance to some of those broad scale patterns that I've described because as I said the heat map approach is quite generalizing and there's a lot of regional variation that you can bring out of that like from preliminary work I've done you you can see some areas which they don't show up at the the largest scale but they're a little bit more resistant to some of these changes than other areas are so I want to bring out some of those regional variations because I think that can tell us some quite interesting things about the way in which different parts of Europe related to each other I have a paper coming out with antiquity very soon. And so that looks at my heat maps in more detail and goes into the the mechanics of the change a little bit more. It's less theoretical than this paper was. I enjoyed writing this paper because I like thinking through some of those choices around the funeral. My next paper in antiquities moved away from that a little bit and is more data focused. But I think the two will complement each other quite nicely. Thank you, Emma, and thanks for joining me. I'm joined now by Dr. Michelle Hayer smith Research Associate at the Hafenreffer Museum of Anthropology at Brown University, and also Kevin P. Smith, the Chief Curator and Deputy Director of the Hafenreffer Museum. Together with Professor Karen Frey of the National Museum of Denmark, they published a paper in medieval archaeology called Tangled Up in Blue. This was research into the dress and dating of an early Viking female burial in Iceland, and specifically aim to understand the complexity of identity of that young woman. So welcome, Michelle. Can you tell me how you came to write this paper and what you were aiming to achieve? I was working on a National Science Foundation research grant looking at archaeological textiles, and I was in Iceland at the time to work on collections-based research. I had looked at the material from this burial as part of my PhD that I did at the University of Glasgow. I had looked at the jewelry of it and not so much the textiles this time. So I was there working on medieval material that had no relation with this particular burial. And they had a a conservator who was there and a jar came to light with a jaw and some human remains floating in formaldehyde that had apparently been in the museum since the 1930s. And she said, well, there looks like there's even flesh on this thing. And then I remembered the burial. I remember I'd looked at the jewelry for my PhD and so on. And I said, you know, are there textiles? And they said, well, it turns out actually there are textiles. And I I was recording materials from the Viking age to the 19th century. So I wanted to collect anything that remained in, in terms of textiles or pseudomorphs or mineralized textiles from the Viking age as well. So we decided sort of there and then to to let's do a project looking at every aspect that we have on this burial. And there was the guy there who was working on bones. She was really concerned about the condition of this face, this half face. And then she did have actually soft tissue. The the whole side of the cheek was still preserved. So when do you find something from the Viking age with still soft (laughs) tissue preserved? And we decided, let's just do as many analyses as we possibly can. And I, I had money in my grant to look at textiles and to run a whole series of analyses on the textiles. Dye analysis, strontium isotope analysis. So there was a component working through Durham University that were working on the skeletal remains. I was working on the dress component, so on the textiles and on the jewelry as well. This eventually morphed into an exhibit at the National Museum of Iceland called The Lady in Blue. We published a catalog based on that, the exhibit itself, And then started to think about things in different ways. I went back and looked at the textiles again and actually identified, I had four, identified four textiles and then identified potentially a fifth one as well. And it was actually during the exhibit or for the exhibit that I brought Kevin in because we did some AMS dating on the textile material. 
And I wanted to do a paper that looked at it from the perspective of the objects of the things that she wore on her body, the clothing, the jewelry, because it was also the oval brooches, as it turned out, that she had on her chest. She was found lying on her left side, but her cheek was resting on the oval brooch, which is one of the reasons why we have this preserved soft tissue. Subsequently, we also found out that there was an eyeball in there somewhere when they first found it. So, I mean, it was that level of preservation. It was incredible. And it was basically everything in the vicinity of that one brooch that kind of preserved the textile, the face. And so I wanted to really do it from that angle, like the adornment, clothing, textiles, jewelry. What does that mean in terms of identity, in terms of cultural affiliation, etc.? We talk a lot about identity and cultural traits, but specifically what questions were you looking to answer? I was interested really also in these questions of identity. How would they have known in the Viking age that this person came from Iceland or came from somewhere else? What is the jewelry or what does the, the dress tell us about where these people come from or how they perceive themselves? And what I found in my PhD work was that the burials in Iceland were, were different from the burials in Scandinavia in the sense that they always seem to include elements of insular dress. So it was a sort of a mix of both material from the British Isles and material from Scandinavia. It starts to bring in interesting ideas about what's the dominant culture, how are people perceiving, it's clearly not a homogeneous society of just Norwegians who had settled Iceland. And welcome also Kevin. I understand there were certain challenges for the project to overcome and some broader questions to answer as well. Yeah, it's, it's important to say, especially for anyone who's listening who may not know, Iceland was settled from Scandinavia and the British Isles uh, relatively late in the Viking Age, the historical sources imply around 870 AD. We're lucky in most parts of Iceland that things can be dated by volcanic ash layers. And across almost all of Iceland, there is a volcanic ash layer dated to 877 plus or minus one. And there's only two or three sites in the very southwest of Iceland where there are any indications of human presence just below that layer and across almost all of Iceland, they're above that layer. Unfortunately, Kettlestad, that are, this woman, was found in the 1930s before the Tefra chronology, which is what we call the ash dating, had been developed. And so, I mean, a very basic question we had was to figure out where she fit within the Viking Age in Iceland. And also, because the east of Iceland just happens to be on the opposite end of the island from Reykjavik, where half of the people in Iceland live, it's an area in which there's been relatively little archeological field work and excavation. And so every time you can get a data point there, which helps you to get a sense where they lived and when they came in to the area, it helps us to understand the speed and the process of settlement all across Iceland. You put together a very multidisciplinary approach. So what was the evidence in fact, and what techniques did you employ? There were some bones, not a lot of bones. The burial was discovered actually by road builders. Things get bashed around and broken. Actually, one of the tops on the oval brooches was knocked off. But she basically had two oval brooches. She had a trefoil brooch, which is one of those three-pronged brooches that they often wore at the neck here to close their garments. 42 beads, a bunch of textile fragments, two whetstones, fragments of a bone comb, a knife handle, a spindle whorl. And she also had this unusual piece of light blue gray chalcedony, which I think was in her hand, if I'm not mistaken. The problem is that the burial is such an old burial. It was excavated between 1938 and 1942. So this is a revisiting of these sort of legacy collections, you know, and, and reworking with these legacy collections. So because I had looked at the jewelry earlier on in my PhD, I, I really focused this time on the textiles and to focus the work. And I thought, okay, well, what can I do in terms of analysis? So a lot of the analyses of textiles involves looking at fibers under a microscope and counting threads and figuring out what weave types you're finding, what fibers you're dealing with, are you dealing with dyes, can you have this analyzed? I also wanted to have the textiles dated and I also had the option to have them analyzed through strontium isotope analysis through a colleague of ours at the National Museum of Denmark, Karen Frey, who had been doing actually a lot of pioneering work on looking at strontium isotopes through wool to determine where and how cloth moves around. In terms of the textiles, it was a real sort of jigsaw puzzle because there were textiles that were mineralized inside the oval brooch. And the oval brooches had these long pins. By pinning it to the garment, you're getting pieces of cloth stuck to the pins 
but you also have them wrapping cloth around sometimes to tie aprons. So looking just at her brooches inside, I was able to extract fragments of uh, linen. And I had these analyzed actually by a professional lab in Chicago to determine exactly what materials we were dealing with. You know, sometimes they're partially mineralized, so there's a little piece that comes out or parts of it are, are completely made out of or have transformed into metal and the other part is a little tiny bit of actual fiber still remaining. They were able to determine that she had some linen, obviously linen textile and then some wool in that. There was also a, a larger piece of cloth that had a tablet woven band on the top and a diamond twill on that. And then the other piece we found was a two to two twill, which is a little bit like a tweed cloth, which had been folded over. So looking at all this material, I came to the conclusion that actually the linen fabric was probably an undergarment. And we know this because there's been a lot of work done on Viking women's garments. And they often did wear, in fact, these long linen undergarments. And over top, they would wear an apron or a type of pinafore that was made either in the shape of a tube or it could be two overlapping panels of cloth. And this was suspended with two straps. So the piece of tablet woven band at the top and the diamond twill that was part of it, they were actually woven together, was telling me that this was probably part of her external outer apron or outer pinafore. So what I did is I had the fibers of that analyzed, which came back as wool. I had them analyzed for dyes and they came back blue, which is a common color that you find actually in Viking burials in the garments of women. And this is where she got her name, the lady in blue, <laughs> of course. And the other piece that was the twill piece, I determined was probably a strap. And that too was also tested positive for indigotin, which is the test they do for blue dyes. So we basically were able to reconstruct a typical Norse women's outfit when I went back and looked at the material again, I found another piece of cloth that was potentially a herringbone twill. And that could be either part of a shawl or it could have been also part of this apron because there's a considerable amount of mixing and matching and recycling that people did with clothing and whatnot. And the strontium analysis, did that bring some surprising results? The interesting thing that came out of it when we did the strontium isotope analysis that Karen Frey did in Copenhagen what was interesting in the way these textiles were woven is that the diamond twill is a very, very rare type of cloth in Iceland. It's not so rare in Norway. Until we did this analysis, it was thought that the diamond twill was not produced at all and was produced mostly in Norway and eventually was a trade item that they were exporting to places like Birka. So you find these very, very elaborate diamond twills. This one was sort of on the coarser end of things, but the strontium isotope told us actually that despite this cloth being very much of a sort of Norwegian type of cloth in the way it was made and spun, was actually made in Iceland. The strap that was blue that was in just a regular twill, or basically if you have a tweed jacket, it's the same kind of weave. That one was very much like medieval cloth from Iceland. And I thought part of it is the, the way it's spun. How was it spun? When you spin to weave textiles, you have the option to spin either clockwise or counterclockwise. If you spin clockwise, you spin Z-spun yarn. And if you do counterclockwise, it's S-spun yarns. In Norwegian textiles and parts of the British Isles, most of the textiles are woven with yarns that are spun Z and Z. So Z in the warp and Z in the web. So that's the vertical and horizontal systems. In Iceland, they do this as well in the Viking period. And then by the medieval period, they stopped that and they're using Z-spun warps and S-spun wefts, which was common in continental Europe as well and in parts of the British Isles, so outside of the Norse settlement areas. I have proposed that these spinning techniques are usually fairly conservative and unchanging over long periods of time. It's because you learn basically, you know, from your parents and it goes down generation to generation. So there's not a lot of variation in textile production, I would say, in a non-industrial context. I thought that, is it possible that the Z to S bun textiles could be in part a response to people coming from the British Isles and bringing a different textile tradition with them and mixing that with Norwegian textile traditions where they're spinning Z to Z. And so I was curious to see where that piece was from as well. And that one also proved to be Icelandic. So they were both Icelandic, one pointing to a potential textile tradition from the British Isles and another one pointing to a textile tradition potentially from Norway. We also wanted to find out not only when she was buried or born, depending on what you were dating, but also whether these textiles that Michelle had spent so much time analyzing 
were contemporary with her burial or were earlier and had been recycled. We knew from a lot of Michelle's work that in places like Greenland, sometimes textiles were reused over a very long period of time, in, at times out of poverty, at times potentially out of a connection to the past. Without the tephra, we relied on radiocarbon dating. And so we dated two of the fragments of textiles, which as Michelle said, we had learned by that point, were produced in Iceland out of Icelandic wool. So the dates for those should tell us something about when farming and wool production had begun or was underway. And then we were lucky enough to get from our colleagues at Durham University, they were able to provide a small sample of collagen from one of her teeth. Knowing when this tooth had erupted and doing microanalysis of where they took out the fragment, they were pretty sure that this collagen had formed when the woman was only about two to three years old as a young child. And so the date on that would give us a sense of when she was, when she was born rather than when she died. We did isotopic work, uh, carbon and nitrogen isotopes on each of the samples that we were going to date. And we found that for the two woolen samples, they were both had the signatures, carbon isotope, nitrogen isotopes, fully consistent with sheep that had grazed entirely on terrestrial vegetation, which is nice and easy. We know in parts of Iceland, they would graze and across the North Atlantic for some of the year, sheep would be grazed at times on seaweed, which would introduce a more complicating factor for the dating because you're getting part of the marine reservoir effect. The woman's tooth, on the other hand, had exactly that problem. When we looked at the carbon nitrogen isotopes, it implied that she had about a 13% diet out of the marine environment. May not have been that as a toddler, she was eating fish or seal meat, but she may have been actually ingesting that while being breastfed as a young child. We can't tell that. So we had to model these first in radiocarbon dating. We had to calibrate them using, on the one hand, a fully terrestrial calibration curve, and on the other hand, a mixed marine terrestrial radiocarbon curve that brought in a 13% marine diet. We assumed in all of these cases that her burial postdated 877 AD, based on all this other evidence from Iceland, including other sites in Eastern Iceland that were above the Lannam Tefer layer of 877. So we started with that as a baseline, and then we did some Bayesian statistical analysis of the radiocarbon dated calibrated samples that allows us to introduce information that we know from outside sources, for example, this 877 AD level, and that this is a pagan style burial, so it probably comes before the conversion of Iceland in 1000 AD. And what were the dates? Putting all of that stuff together, the results we got was that the textiles really tightly and nicely linked up. They were contemporary with one another, almost identical dates from two different types of fabric. So we knew it wasn't just the same sheep. And those were suggesting that the textiles were woven around the end of the ninth century, really between about 880 and 895 AD. Her tooth collagen, on the other hand, at age two to three formed sometime between 891 and 965 AD. So considerably after the textiles had been done. So textiles were contemporary with one another, but probably not with the time of her death. If she died at age 17 to 25, as the physical analysis done by our colleagues had suggested, it would imply that she was buried at the earliest around 905 and at the latest 987 AD. But if we took sort of the median of all of the radiocarbon dates, about age 980, 930, it means she would have died sometime between 945 and say 955 AD. And that's telling us that the cloth was already at least one, possibly two generations old at the time that she was buried in them. And that's pretty much what we got out of the out of the dating. And it really did imply, on the one hand, that the textiles being woven out of Icelandic wool, uh, that we do have a pretty good marker for there being uh, farming going on in that part of Iceland, if we can assume that the wool was from sheep that lived in eastern Iceland at about the same time as everywhere else in Iceland. But the sheep fits into this period when Icelandic identity is really forming. It's when you see the parliament beginning. It's when you see the first references to people as Icelanders. And when we see all across Iceland burials beginning to become more formulaic, as though there's a sense of an identity being developed around those. So given all this data, what can you say now about the woman in blue? 
when I started to break down exactly what she had in terms of artifacts as well, she had a, a pair of oval brooches, which were in a later style of dress. The, the oval brooch was a type of fashion that lasted a few hundred years. Her burial actually is not unlike some of the Scottish burials I had looked at. And the one I'm thinking about is Castletown in Scotland, which also has a similar, in fact, the same type of brooch. You know, she had this little trefoil brooch that had these acanthus leaves and this type of item, not so much the brooch, but these type of trefoil is adapted by the Scandinavians from models of Carolingian baldric mounts. And then frequently you'll find them in the Viking world transformed with gripping beasts and animal art in them. Or else in this case, they simply replicated the acanthus, except that brooch was made in Norway. In her beads, for example, she had an amber bead from the Baltic, a jet bead or lignite bead from Whitby in England, these glass segmented beads which come from the Mediterranean. She had a piece of chalcedony that came from Iceland, a bone knife handle, some bits of iron, and then the textile traditions that on one hand are pointing towards Norway, but potentially also traditions from the British Isles. And I think this kind of sums up the issue of identity in Iceland in that period. Is, and it's actually very similar to some of the other burials that I had worked on during my PhD, is looking, in fact, at this kind of amalgamation of cultural symbols from different cultures. Not only that, but also tapping into these vast trade networks that actually the Vikings had stuff from everywhere. And that's becoming increasingly clear with other research projects trading all over the place. And, and this stuff is ending up in remote graves in northeastern Iceland. But I think in terms of their cultural identity, what is this saying? I mean, the fact that she clearly had all these grave goods is suggestive that she was probably someone of some status. So she was clearly given something that was rather prestigious, but clearly she's potentially of mixed cultural background, which is not actually you know, unheard of because a lot of people were settled in the Hebrides, for example, married local wives, had children. This is basically the idea behind the Hiberno-Norse. And what you're seeing in Iceland is really this kind of Hiberno-Norse culture. There's clearly a predominance, I would say the dominant culture is definitely Norwegian, the, the structure, the law. But when it comes to the nitty gritty of everyday life, I think everybody was all mixed up. We know from the medieval sources, the sagas, Landama book as well, the Book of Settlements, have always suggested that there was a mixture of people from these areas. DNA work done recently in Iceland on modern and living Icelanders and on archaeological remains of early Icelanders has confirmed that with a sense of a fairly large component of the female population being derived from the British Isles and the men being largely from Scandinavia. Much of that is written from a man's perspective and about men. And so this opportunity uh, really gives a glimpse into these women who, in this case, seems to have a very interestingly combined identity how their lives were lived and also how those who buried them, how they used material culture and how they used these elements in what would have been one of the more frequent public rituals of Icelandic life in the mid 10th century, which were the burials by which people are dressed and furnished and put aside or put into the ancestors in ways that were helping to identify them as well as identify their family and how they were seen within this emerging and developing community. I think that's really important to think about and the unity there, because we often talk about Iceland in the Viking age as though it was natural, normal, and anticipated that Iceland would become one Iceland. When it was not settled by a uniform group setting out to create a society, it could have easily been for an island that size, many different polities in different areas. And so this act of creation in the 10th century, mid 10th century of a unified society or a society that provided networks for unifying itself are also being expressed in burials like this. We wonder, is this the burial also of a free woman or mm. the burial of a concubine lavishly adorned? What was her role in society? How was she perceived? Or, you know, is she passively receiving these symbols or actively involved in, in stating who she was as a free woman? This is a huge contribution to the field. So where does the discipline take this from here? I think the Icelandic burial situation is perhaps improving, but it was definitely the case for some time that it was less accessible to the English speaking world because most of the material is published in Icelandic. I think it informs people who are working on this material in other parts of the Viking world 
gives them the opportunity to think about what's happening in the periphery, in a sense, what's happening in these colonies as well. So I think it was great also from the Icelandic perspective to be able to tell such a complete story. They've dealt well with the burials in Iceland. Our colleagues are very good at what they do, but a lot of the work has been focused on the objects found in the burials as opposed to the burials as the actual remains of individuals. And so this is a really interesting project as a really interdisciplinary attempt to try to develop the biography of one person in that time and really be able to think about yeah. the archaeological record, not just in the larger processes, but at the level of the individual and how that person fits in. So there are opportunities to replicate this in other ways with different individuals. I think that also gives the public and the professional world something to hang their hat on, that it's not just the abstraction but that you can put yourself into this situation of this individual and then begin using that to address more nuanced questions, not only at the level of the individual, but also more expansive questions about now that we know that about this person, how does that fit into the larger society? To give people an opportunity to sort of a model to follow and also a model to break because that's how science works. And what about personally? What's next for you? Since that project, I've actually, I've been working not only in Iceland, but I've actually started to look at trade in cloth from the Viking Age to the early modern period between the European mainland and Greenland, Iceland, the Faroe Islands, Orkney, potentially all these peripheral region, because what I found through my research was actually that in Iceland, for example, textiles by the medieval period becomes a form of currency. It also becomes a huge trade commodity that is being imported into Norway, into other parts of Europe. They're making a type of cloth that is cheap to buy, that is used for clothing the poor, for clothing religious orders, soldiers. So right now I've been working with Norwegian colleagues and we're trying to document in the early medieval period, in the late medieval period, how much material in the urban sites, let's say in Bergen, are coming in fact from Iceland and from other parts of the North Atlantic, using strontium isotopes, but also using historic texts to figure out what are we able to track. I was working, Ash, on a, a pretty spectacular Viking Age sacrificial site about 300 meters back into one of the largest lava caves in Iceland. We've got a paper coming out in Journal of Archaeological Science on that. This is a um, site inside a lava field that was formed at the same time that the textiles were being woven in the east of Iceland uh, in the first major volcanic eruption that northern Europeans had seen since the Ice Age. Had this massive cave that was used as a sacrificial site for almost 80 years, with the name of it, Surtur being the name of the being who the Norse believed to destroy the world at the end of time. This is quite possibly where the myth of Surtur was born and where the Icelanders contributed to the understanding of Ragnarok, the end of time. But it certainly was something that, just as with Kettlestad, that they had uh, material from all over the Viking world, we have bits of arsenic or pigment, which, are, uh, which is from Eastern Turkey inside this cave, otherwise only found in, as the pigment on the burial furnishings of King Gorm of Denmark in the shields of the Gokstad ship beads as at Kettlestather from as far away as Byzantium and the Caliphate. I look forward to reading that. Thank you for joining me, Kevin and Michelle. And you can follow up on all these publications on the website. Please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button. Foreigncountries.podbean.com So that brings us to the end of this episode of Foreign Countries. Join me next time for another conversation. 